Good afternoon and welcome, welcome, welcome to another Clearwater Jazz Holiday Foundation's Young Lions Jazz Master Virtual Sessions. I am your host, Michael Kernodal, and I'm delighted today to have none other than today's educator, J.J. Patishaw. <clears throat> and the topic is using blues as a foundation. So I want to thank everyone for joining us here live. If you're here with us, uh, if you have questions or comments, there's a little feature in there that's called chat. Go in there, type your questions. We love interaction and we'll save some time closer to the end to answer any questions. You know what? This would not be possible without our awesome sponsors. So I want you to please be sure to check out the studio archives of all of our past video sessions at clearwaterjazz.com's education outreach section. And that's brought to you by Blue Water Wealth Management at Stewart Partners and Duke Energy, as well as our Young Lions podcast available wherever you stream. <clears throat> and that's brought to you by our friends at Marine Max Clearwater. You can search Young Lions Jazz Master Virtual Sessions wherever you stream. I mean, where can I start? I mean, JJ has given us so many great sessions, but if you don't know who he is, JJ Patishaw is the next generation in a lineage of talented musicians, educators, and community leaders firmly rooted in the cultural tradition and creative innovation. Born into a musical family, JJ's love for music was cultivated from an early age. <clears throat> Growing up surrounded by some of the finest musicians and entertainers in the Southeast, he has brought up on the music of artists ranging from Louis Armstrong to Ray Charles, Stevie Wonder to the Neville Brothers, and Willie Nelson and Bob Marley and the Wailers. Man, what a lineup you have there. <laughs> Today, as a sought-after guitarist, vocalist, and instructor steeped in jazz and roots traditions, JJ is quickly making a name for himself as both a solo artist and a consummate a companist. His global outlook combined with a down-home sensibility give him a unique ability to connect with audience from all walks of life. With a deep reverence for old school sounds and wisdom and an eye on the horizon, JJ is a dynamic artist on the rise. So with no further delay, JJ, the stage is all yours. Hey, Mike, thank you so much for uh, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, you know, it's always a pleasure to be here with the Clearwater Jazz Holiday. Thank you to the Clearwater Jazz Holiday and all our sponsors uh, for making this possible. Um, these lessons have really just turned into such a great resource for um, for the, the community at large, for not only for our students, but just even for music lovers and community students as well. Um, this lesson is going to be geared towards um, this. Well, actually, I'd say I'll back up the next kind of series of lessons that we're working on here will be geared towards those with essentially a um, some foundational guitar. Um, uh, maybe at least some uh, probably geared towards intermediate uh, late beginners to early intermediate players that have been playing for some time. Um, and especially those that are either entering the middle school or high school jazz ensembles and are looking for a place to start. I know that uh, uh, when we step into jazz, it can be uh, it can be daunting at times, even even when you've been playing a while, right? There are so many different approaches. There are so many different ideas um, and great um, and there's so much great information out there today. Um, and sometimes weeding through it and finding out which is going to work the best for you and what you need um, can be can be a difficult task. So I hope that these lessons over the next uh, several weeks will kind of give you a roadmap of how to start navigating this music we call jazz. So um, let's get us today's lesson with that in mind. Um, we're going to talk about the blues. And before we jump into that, I'm going to give you for those of you who are with me, um, I'm going to give you uh, just a quick tune up here. So we're on the same page. I'm going to give you a low E. And I'll give you your high E. All right. So 
what we were what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the blues and this is really going to be kind of an introductory lesson because this is something i believe that we will come back to um in more depth as the weeks go on um we'll definitely spend some time talking more about the history and kind of where it comes from and why it's so important and we'll touch on that today but um definitely we'll get more into depth with kind of just understanding the blues as an art form in itself down the road um but just some general knowledge that you should probably know, right? Blues developed in the kind of 1860s in the Deep South. So more often than not, right, when we think about blues, um, we associate it with regions like the Mississippi Delta, um, the Gulf Coast. Um, just all throughout the South, there's great blues traditions from Texas to, uh, to Mississippi to St. Louis, I mean, all over. So um, it's important to understand that. What is the blues? Blues originated, um, has a rich history, but also originated from African-American spirituals in the early days of slavery. Um, we have a music that is rooted in kind of a, a blend of African-American spirituals, work songs, field hollers, um, and narrative style ballad. Um, and what we want to understand about that is that the blues is in itself is the backbone of so much of uh, the music that we love and appreciate today. So the popular and especially when we're talking about um, American music, um, the impact of blues can really not be understated. So everything from rock and roll, right? This is the, when we hear about uh, the typical kind of uh, rock and roll groove. To something uh, blues has impacted R&B soul music funk music uh, hip-hop um, it, it is in so much of the dance music it's interesting blues has had a global impact I mean, we can find um, elements of the blues in more uh, modern um, uh, more modern uh, styles throughout the continent of Africa, throughout Europe, I mean, everywhere. So um, I think it's important to understand that uh, the impact, again, cannot be kind of understated. Um, so with that in mind, I always look at blues as well, uh, has been a great foundation for getting into jazz. Um, if any of you have been playing guitar for any amount of time, at some point, especially, especially as guitar players, we even if we don't spend a lot of time there, we end up dealing with the blues for a little while because it's such an important, especially when we're talking about guitar, it is almost um, it's synonymous with the instrument in so many ways uh, when we talk about rock music, especially if you're coming from, I don't care if you're playing more traditional rock to punk music, to hardcore music, to metal, um, the blues, whether it's, whether you can pick it out or not, uh, upon first listen, it's in there. So it's important to kind of understand that. Um, so the beauty of that is that it can really lay, um, for us guitar players, I feel like it has the ability to help us kind of move into the realm of jazz um, and what we think of as jazz. So we'll talk more about that as well. But for now, I think the blues um, is just such a great tool for understanding the core elements of jazz because in many ways um you know blues and jazz have always kind of had these parallel um seem to have always had these kind of parallel paths they mer have merged and at different points and they've also developed in their own ways right based off of regional regional influences based off of popular influences um but they've always had a, a deep relationship it's kind of um different branches of the same tree, if you will. Um, so it, for me, I find that having that understanding um, as a guitar player gives me a, a starting point with getting into to jazz, because especially when we're talking about early jazz and a lot of the music that you're gonna be dealing with in the beginning um, in your, your jazz ensembles within the school systems, um, a lot of those tunes from Duke Ellington to Count Basie to, to Louis Armstrong, to 
George Benson, right? All of those, all of those composers and players um, have deep ties and deep roots in the blues. Um, so I think that's, to me, that is kind of a great way to, to begin your journey. So, so then we say, okay, well, well, in what way? So now we can, we've got a, a general idea of the historical side of it. Um, but now we need some more practical application and what is, in what ways can we use the blues as sort of a template for playing this music? And so in my mind, the blues and jazz incorporate some of the, excuse me, both, um, possess, um, some very, some of the same, actually really some of the same, um, properties, right? So we've got, we've got, uh, improvisation in both styles. So improvisation is inherent to blues. Improvisation is inherent to jazz, right? You've got the call and response that is deeply rooted in the, the African-American spirituals and field haulers that we'll talk more about what that means, but the whole call and response, um, idea that we, that you hear throughout so much of, so much of black American music, really. Um, we've also got your, just a really solid song form to deal with. Um, in jazz, you'll see whether you're dealing with a 32 bar song form, whether you're doing, dealing with a 12 bar song form. Um, but I think with blues, it's just, it's, it's kind of accessible in a lot of ways, right? With blues, even in jazz, more often than not, we're dealing with the, the traditional um, 12 bar blues. There are variations, but the 12 bar form um, is something that is manageable for a lot of us. The rhythmic sensibilities, right? So rhythm is deeply tied to blues and to jazz. Um, having an under, and even when we talk about um, the swing, whether we're talking about, uh, you know, a swing pattern um, that is so um, characteristic of a lot of our early jazz and even contemporary and straight ahead jazz, um, you know, it's not too far off. It's really a kind of a, I don't even know if I should say a cousin or a sister to the blues shuffle, right? That six, eight rhythm is just kind of also inherent in so many ways. Um, to both of those styles. So rhythmically, they have deep ties. So for me, and, um, and again, uh, and then the, the melodic sensibility, you know, when we're talking about that, that sense of melody, improvised melody, and we'll get into more of that. But I think, again, um, for me, that lays a nice groundwork. Now, Maybe you haven't spent a lot of time with the blues. What is it when we're talking about, we'll back up for a moment. Well, what does that mean when we're talking about a 12 bar blues? Um, 12 measures, right? If you spend any time in, a, in any of your on, ensembles, it's just bars is kind of a, a contemporary way of saying measures. All right, so we've got 12 measures. And for the most part, the cool thing about the blues, right? It's still even in jazz, it's based more or less around the one the four and the five. Okay, so one, four, five. These are all things that we're gonna get into more I'll, again over the next several weeks where we'll, we'll talk about building a code, excuse me, where we'll talk about building a chord vocabulary um, and what all that entails. We actually have some lessons up on the site that you can go back where I talk a little bit about um, chord progressions, um, but we'll get more into depth about that. But if you go back through our archives, there are some lessons on the site that deal with um, kind of understanding, well, what is a one and a four, a five, or two, five, one? You hear all these kind of numerical um, patterns. And if you're trying to kind of decipher what that is, it really just means you know, where the chord lays within the context of the scale. If you have seven notes in a scale, right? Well, you, the one is the chord that's built off of the first note in the scale. In this case, we're gonna deal with the key of B flat. B flat, C, D, E flat, F, G, A, and B flat. So that's a major scale, right? So I'm gonna deal with, I'm up here on the sixth fret. So we're gonna deal up here. So we're gonna, we're gonna, start with the one which is the b flat so then we'll go to the four well what is the four the four is the chord that's literally built on 
the fourth note of the scale in the case in the context of a b flat major scale that would be uh an e flat and i'm going to get up here i'll get closer to the screen and let you all see these chords as well um, i'll get closer up so you can get a kind of a, an up close view in just a moment and then we've got the five which is the chord that's built on the fifth note of the scale and that's going to be your f so b flat d <laughs> excuse me b flat c d e flat and f so now the other thing that you need to know about the blues that for the most part there are exceptions right when we're you'll hear things like minor blues like what's a minor blues all right um in that type of blues has a kind of a different sound i'll tell you about that in a second but for the most part blues is based around dominant chords mm -hmm. which the beauty of that is that you're also going to need those mm -hmm. dominant chords for your jazz, right dominant chords are all over jazz right those are uh those are where we start really getting into some interesting um chord voicings when we start really reaching into the upper extensions you get all sorts of interesting dissonances with dominant chords mm -hmm. So any of those funky chords that you're hearing, those are those are dominant chords. So what is a dominant chord? A dominant chord just means you have a major a major triad with a with a flat seven on the top. So in the case of the B flat scale, it's B flat, D, F, and E flat. So when I'm talking about it's any kind of a major chord, if I'm dealing with a C dominant seven, right, that would mean C, E, G, and then I have the B flat, which is the flat seven on top. So, and that moves all around the neck. If you're dealing with an A flat dominant, A flat, C, E flat, G flat. Okay, so getting that sound, that dominant sound, so even though we're playing a one, four, five, those are all going to be B flat dominant seven, E flat dominant seven to F dominant seven. I'm going to get up real close here so you can see what I'm doing. So when I get up, so when I get up here, if I'm lining up at the sixth fret, I've got essentially a bar going across that sixth fret. I've got my second finger on the third string in the seventh fret, and I've got my third finger here on the fifth string, which is the A string in the eighth fret. When I play that, the beauty of being a guitar player too is that, you know, don't tell anybody, but we can kind of cheat. So if you haven't figured that out already, once you've learned a dominant seven chord um, on the sixth fret, right? Well, it's movable. So now I've essentially unlocked the entire neck with my root. The root in this case is the B flat is here on the sixth string. And I talk about what that means um, in a previous lesson as well, where we're talking about the root on the, uh, whether your root is on the sixth string or your root is on the fifth string. When we're talking about the root on the fifth string, well, in this case, if I'm playing an E flat dominant, I'm going to line up here almost like my the same shape that I would play like a C chord. I'm going to move it up here again to the sixth fret. And then I put my fourth finger here on the third string in the sixth fret. So that's an E flat dominant. And the beauty of this chord, I'm just playing those four middle strings. I'm going to move that up too. That's movable. So I'm up here at the eighth fret with the root here on the eighth fret that's an f so now i just went from b flat seven e flat seven to f7 again i'm just playing those four middle strings i'm not playing the the low end here and i'm not playing the top string so 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 now what we're going to do here so I've got my dominant chord. So the beauty of this, once I've unlocked this one, four, five progression at the sixth fret, well, guess what? Now you've unlocked essentially a one, four, five around the entire neck. So maybe you're playing a tune in the key of C. Well, all I got to do is move up two frets 
And now here I am, I'm back at the eighth fret, C7, F7, G7. We can also, we don't have to always say uh, C dominant seven. It's just kind of understood universally. If you say C7, F7, G7, more often than not, honestly, if you're looking at a lead sheet, you're gonna see C7, G7, F7, E flat seven. So, but just know that that's the same as your dominant chord. So right here, so let's say um, you get a tune in F7, right? or excuse me, the key of F. I can jump all the way down here to the first fret. And now I do the same idea. Now I had to change my fingering here. I'll show you this one. Uh, I've got some lessons on this also, but I'll just do a quick review. If you look back in our previous lessons, an alternate way to play your, obviously when you get down to this end of the neck, I'm running out of room to play that uh, that B flat dominant seven the way we were before. So all I have to do is create a bar here on the from the fifth string down. And I put my third finger, that's on the first fret. On the third fret, I've got my fourth third finger on the third on uh, the fourth string, my fourth finger on the second string. So and I'm playing again. I'm playing from the fifth string down actually. So bar on the first fret, third fingers on the fourth string on the third fret, and then I've got my pinky or my fourth finger on the second string in the third fret as well. Now the beauty of this shape is also movable. So this is a B flat dominant seven or B flat seven. So in the case of you could just as well, if you're playing going back to the where we were up here when I played that one, four, five, like this, B flat seven, E flat seven, F seven. I could also play that E flat seven this way. So with this new fingering that I just gave you. And as soon as we start doing that, right, you can already hear a lot of our If you're dealing with James Brown, right? James Brown is constantly dealing with dominant seventh. So when I'm playing, getting those sounds in your kind of in your ears and kind of really kind of dialing in with what those sound like, your dominant seven chords, that's going to really help you as well with kind of of leaning into the blues. So, so right now you're seeing we've, we're, we've got a 12 bar form. So we've got our chords. Now let's talk about the form. Well, what does that mean? So I'm just going to deal with the, um, with the one, the four and the five in B flat. And remember, as we're doing this, you can translate this up and down the neck is well, you're going to have to know kind of the, the overall makeup of the neck where the notes lie on the neck, you know, wh where your roots are on the sixth and the fifth string. But once you know that, you can really kind of navigate your way. So if, again, if you have a chord progression and let's say you can tell it's like if your band director comes up to you and says, well, uh, I want you to play all blues. It's a one, four, five in G. You're like, OK. Even if you haven't quite figured out, you're still working on understanding how the chord progressions work. Maybe you're trying to still understand, you know, what the one is, the four, what the two is. You're still kind of dialing that in. Don't overthink it in the beginning. Cover the part, right? My whole idea is if you can at least have a chord to cover the part, if you can at least play a pattern, there's to me, there's no shame in that. Yes, you need to understand what you're doing. But if you have a concert coming up or performance and you're new to jazz, you just need to play what your instructor needs you to play. And later on, you can hopefully you connect with a either a guitar instructor or you can hang out with your band director after the fact and you know pick his brain or her brain on any questions that you may have. So if that's the case, so this pattern, the reason why I said it is that just from a strictly mechanical approach you can move you can play what i've showed you whether you're playing the dominant seven this way the original way that's like the c chord or whether i'm playing it this way so we've 
we're dealing with B flat seven. Now I want to go to E flat seven. Now I want to go to F seven. So now I've got all the chords that I need for the blues for this particular chord progression. Um, so now we say, okay, I know that the blues, this, um, my instructor told me, my band director told me that it's just a, it's a 12 bar blues. Okay. I know I've got the one, the four and the five, Maybe, hopefully by that time, you'll have a lead sheet in front of you. You'll see the chords. We'll talk more about that too. But for now, once you've got that, we need to, so how do we lay it out? So I can say, okay, first four bars are going to be B flat. This is 12 bars, right? So first four measures are is B flat. So what does that mean? One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four. Now I'm going to the four for two bars, two measures. That's the E flat seven. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. Then it says I'm going back to the root, which is the B flat for two more bars. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. Now we're in the last so that we've played eight bars so far, right? Eight measures of the blues. Now we're going to lean into the, uh, the last four bars, which is going to be start on the five, which is F. For one measure, one, two, three, four. We're going to go down a whole step back to the four. One, two, three, four, which is E flat. I'll get up close so you guys can see this again. And then back to the B flat. Two, three, four. If there's a turnaround, which more often than not there is, you might go back to the five, which is the F. Seven. So it's B flat seven, E flat seven, F seven. Now, the last thing we need to also understand is that we're also dealing with four, four time. All right, so that just means you have four quarter notes in every measure. So when I'm feeling it, every four bar, every four counts, I'm moving on to a new, another bar. So in this case, I'll play some rhythm with it and I'll show you kind of how I'm approaching this rhythm in a second. So I'm gonna get back up here so you can see, starting on the B flat. So I'm just gonna play some basic quarter notes. Two, two, three, B flat. I'm going to the E flat. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. That's our two bars, right? Back to the root for two bars. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. That's eight. That's uh, eight bars so far. Last four bars, that'll give us 12. Starting at the F7 on the eighth fret to here I go. One, two, three. Watch this. Walk down on beat four, same form, same shape. Land on the E flat. You'll sound real hip if you do that, by the way. Don't do it all the time, it might drive people crazy. E flat seven, and then back to the B flat. Last bar on F. So now I'm gonna show you what that sounds like. Um, I'll show you what that sounds like um, kind of within the context of an actual of a song um, without any stops. So I'm just going to so you can see how kind of cool it sounds. Two, three. You also have to there even within the context of blues there are different styles of blues whether it's um more of a slow kind of like a slow ballad or slow blues whether it's a shuffle um if you're playing more of a straight ahead blues um so there even within the the context of just the genre that we think of as blues there are different ways to approach it rhythmically um more often than not we're going to spend a, a, like a whole lot of time talking about rhythm because for me, rhythm is always the foundation of where I come from when it comes to playing. You need to be able to play, even, even to me above 
improvisation, you need to be able to hold down the line rhythmically and, and compensate, or excuse me, and to comp um, your part before, because to me, there are so many times the, the improvisation is the, the flashy part, right? And it is essential and integral to jazz for sure. But to me, if, if it really comes down to it in year, uh, if it's a choice between, if I have a gig and I need a guitar player, one that I says, well, this guy's a really good improviser, but his rhythm's okay and hurt. She's a really good rhythm player. Um, I'm probably going to use her because of the fact that um, I need that strong rhythmic sense. We need somebody to, to, to comp along, especially if it's just you and a sim. Sometimes on guitar, you're going to be playing with a, a vocalist or a, another instrumentalist. You might just be a duo that being able to keep that rhythm going, whether it's in a big band or whether it's in a small combo is uh, really important um, because it's also your, you're a timekeeper. Um, even if you're, even if you have a drummer, even if there are others around you who are, who you're kind of playing more of a so supportive role for, you still need to have that rhythmic sensibility. Okay. So that's, that's kind of where I come from with all of that. Um, so once I, but for in the beginning, all I'm doing for a rhythm, I like to say you, that kind of typical swing rhythm that you'll hear from between shuffles and straight ahead tunes. Um, we can just start there because there are all sorts of ways to approach comping. But in the beginning, just start with straight, those are quarter notes. One, two, three, four. And the way is we don't really want those sustained. We don't want the kind of sustained chords here. I want to go with a more, um, I want to have a little more control over the sound. So when I do that, I like to say I'm kind of pumping the strings. And what I mean by that is I'm literally, my fingers are in place. But when I do it, as soon as I finish strumming, I press down, I lay into the strings on the left hand. And as soon as I pass through, think of it as like a dampener pedal on the piano. If you've ever played piano, I lift up those fingers. I keep them in place, but now I just kill the sound there. So when I approach my rhythmic my rhythmic playing, I go one, two, on the one, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four. Next chord, one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, four, two, two, and now we're on, this would be nine, measure nine, right, or bar nine, one, just kind of boom, bah, bah, and back into it. And we're going to, like I said, we'll spend more time dealing with rhythm down the road here. So the last thing um, that we want to talk about um, just for today, we're going to spend more time with getting into the blues. We'll get deeper into it down the road. Um, but for today, you can also uh, any if you've if you're coming from a rock or a folk background, if at some point you played a minor pentatonic or a minor blues or excuse me, a blues scale, right? That all still transfers to jazz. So the beauty of that, you've got a lot of, if you've been playing guitar for any amount of time and you've learned any of that, you're already a step ahead because um, that's all going to come with you into, into this kind of this space now. So all I'm doing, right, is the one flat three. I'm lining up just our traditional tried and true box shape. Four frets. I line it up here. I'm starting at the sixth fret, six, seven, eight, and nine. But right now we're fine. We're not going to get too much and get too crazy into the theory today. I just want you to know how to navigate it. Because in the beginning, you need to know, you just need to cover the part. So again, what I'm doing, if you've not, if you haven't played a blues scale, 
I'm lining up here and I'm just gonna call you the finger numbers. I just say, if you line it up in this box, the beauty of it is that you don't have to go outside of that box. So if I have a note here, so it's gonna go, here's your fingerings, one, four. So the first finger remembers on the sixth fret, fourth finger is on the ninth fret. So we'll start with a minor pentatonic, right? It's a five note scale. So it's one, four. I'm gonna to go to the next fret, or excuse me, the next string, one, three. One, three on the next string, one, three on the next string, one, four, one, four. And again, those numbers that I'm calling out are the finger numbers. Backwards descending, four, one, four, one, three, one, three, one, three, one, four, one. So check this out. So this is a B flat minor pentatonic. The beauty of this again is that once you have this scale, you can move this up and down the neck. You can at least cover the part. If you're stepping into this, you're feeling a little kind of um, in over your head, it's okay. Just go with what you know in the beginning. So if I've got this minor pentatonic, uh, let's see, the next tune is a G blues. Okay. I can go here. G minor pentatonic. So if I play that on top of a dominant chord, I'm just playing the same, I just line up. It's a four finger box consecutive or chromatic frets here. It doesn't matter where I move it. All you need to know is your root, your starting point. So here in the beginning, again, this is, we're just, we're kind of laying a foundation with this music. I just want to play and I want to communicate and I want to have fun, all right? So now, it doesn't matter where I move it, if I start here on the fifth fret, I'm on the A, I'm playing an A blues, or this is an A minor pentatonic. So the one difference now between the minor pentatonic and the, like a, a blues scale essentially, is the passing tone, or what we call a blue note, right? So the blue note is the passing tone. So in this case, if I go one, four, so this is one, four, instead of going one, three on the next string, I'm gonna go one, two, three, and then back to one, three. If this is the minor, if this is your minor pentatonic, now we're gonna play minor, excuse me, now we're just gonna play blues scale. So B flat minor pentatonic one more time. B flat blues. You're not really hanging on that note. You're literally just passing through. And a lot of, we call those blue notes. And so now I continue that trend. So it's one, four, one, two, three, one, three. This is still in the B flat blues. Now check this out. One, three, four, one, four, one, four. Four one four one four three one three one three two one four one again four three one on the third string three one three two one four one and again this is movable so if you have a C blues all I have to do is move up two frets, right? A whole step. Now I'm playing the C blues. I think in the beginning, it's really important. It's jazz, what we think of as jazz theory can be daunting at times. Um, but I think the way to approach it is to just really try to simplify it as much as you can to make it accessible again try to just cover the part um you're going to be surrounded by you know people who know more than you probably and you're in and people who are also on the same journey as you even if it's on a different instrument who are exploring what the blues is or is understanding this theory so don't be afraid of you know to ask the questions ask them you know if you have a question whether it, when it comes to the theory when it comes to what they're doing rhythmically um just you know don't hesitate to ask your instructors your um and your peers all right so but in the beginning 
if I'm playing a blues, sweet. So check this out. So now, and there are, this is a general, um, this is just the beginning. Okay. So this is not, not um, where we're, where we're ending by any means, as far as when it comes to the blues, because um, sometimes these scales, right. They're a great starting point, but they're not going to get you. Um, it's not going to take you the full distance, right? If we want to just start there, they're going to be, it'll get you pretty far, especially in the beginning, but there are going to be other things down the road as you grow as a player that you'll need to understand when it comes to theory that sometimes that blue scale won't quite fit within the context of, of other chord, uh, or chord progressions. But for today, um, for all purposes, I think we can kind of just start with this because you can take that information, you know, that many of you may already have and apply it to um, use it as kind of like a bridge into um, the realm that we think of as jazz. Um, so check this out. Um, a great tune, if you want to kind of hear this exemplified, I'm just going to play a little clip here. It's Freddie the Freeloader by Miles Davis from his album Kind of Blue. It's in B flat. So B flat, you know, you're also dealing with just two flats, you're dealing with B flat and E flat, so you're not having to um, deal with any crazy sharps or flats. Um, key signature is pretty straightforward. And the form is very easy to hear. So we're gonna listen to this and I'm gonna count the form along with you, all right? And you'll see how this all applies. And I wanna play a little bit too, so here it is. Here we go, back it up. Nice, straightforward melody, pretty simple, but it's great. Easy to remember. And check this out. Back to the top, here goes. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four, two, three, four, two, two. This is the four, back to the one. Three, four, two, five. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. Back to the, back to the one. All right. So with Freddie the Freeloader, it's almost, it's pretty much exactly what we just talked about form-wise. All right. It's twelve bar blues. The only difference is the first time through the chord chorus. Two, three, four. This is the uh, bar five, six, two, three, four, seven, two, three, three, two. It's this chord right here. That chord right there. So the form is like this for Freddy the Freeloader. If you have like iReal book or something like that, you can pull that up. I'm also gonna put together a PDF that you'll be able to access later on. I'll send that over to the guys at Clearwater and you can also download that um, at a later time with all the information we've discussed today. All right, so in this case, the only difference in Freddy the Freeloader, two, three, four, first four bar, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, back to the four, that's E flat, right? Two, two, three, four, back to B flat. Two, three, four, two, two, three, four, five, four and check this out miles does something really cool here he just it's simple but effective he goes to the a flat which is technically it would be like a like a flat seven right if you're in the key if you're dealing with the key of b flat so it would sound like this two three as you get more comfortable rhythmically you can kind of do these kind of little Half step kind of uh, would be the equivalent of like a grace note. And then the second time through, the form is pretty much just straightforward. He goes two, four, two, two, three, four, two, three, four, four, two, three, to the four. And he lands on the one, all right? 
so you didn't even have to play a turn around on the five on that second one. So that's a great tune to start with. It's a simple melody, um, but that's easy to follow. That's really just based again around uh, more or less around the pentatonic movement. <laughs> tune in the beginning you can use your minor pentatonic we'll talk more about what goes into building a solo right later on even within the context of the blues but today we just want to look at this as kind of a you can kind of get that scale form under your under your fingers. We've got the minor pentatonic, we've got the blues. Get these chord forms under your fingers. Understand the song form because if you can keep time and under follow this song form, that's really going to set you up for more complex more complex song forms. The cool thing about Freddie the Freeloader too, right, is that it's just different enough, right? There's two two passes through the through the form. First twelve bars are um, going to be um, the first 12 bars that you go through, right? That's on the turnaround there. The turnaround is that kind of that pivot chord, that A flat. You need the second time through, that's where we landed on the root, right? Where he goes. So that's the first time through. Play through the song form. And again, when you get to the last, you'll see that turnaround there. And then you would open it up for your your solos. Um, and start listening. Listen to players find blues uh, from. There's some again. There's no shortage of great guitarists. You don't have to only listen to guitarists. I mean, you can listen to Charlie Parker. You can listen to Louis Armstrong, um, Charlie Christian. But um, but as a guitar player, there is no shortage of guitar great guitar players who really play the blues well as early as going back to earlier recordings of Charlie Christian to players like Wes Montgomery, check out Grant Green, one of the funkiest guitarists out there. Um, definitely steeped in the blues, right up to George Benson, John Schofield, and the list goes on. Um, so that said, that's really gonna take us where we need to go today. Start spending some time with the blues, spend some time, the history. And again, don't, don't, uh, don't forget to check out your players like B.B. King, uh, Gary Clark Jr. He's a great contemporary. These are more kind of rock or more traditional blues players. Uh, Jimi Hendrix, right? You can't you, you can't deny the impact that they've had on the music, both within the realm of more traditional blues forms and within the realm of jazz. But just open your ears, listen to all of it, because you never know what you might take, how that might make its way into your playing, even within the context of jazz. So there's always, even to today, there's kind of this conversation that continues to go on between jazz and blues. And it's always kind of this back and forth kind of relationship where they're pulling from, from each other. So um, it's a, a deep relationship that is worth kind of spending some time with. Um, really rich and interesting and just fun to play. So I hope that this will at least give you a starting place for how to approach jazz. Um, again, um, feel free, you can find me at JJ Patashall Music on Instagram. Um, if you want to do lessons, if you want, just have a question, you can find me. Don't hesitate, I'm also on WhatsApp. Um, and I can get you all my information and we can connect. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, or even just recommended listening. So, by, uh, by all means, um, thank you again for taking time out to chat today. And we will um, do this again very soon. Oh, and for those of you who are out there, um, if you, this is something that you're into, uh, May 26th at the studio at 620, um, depending on when you see this video, it may or may not have already happened. I'll be down at the studio 620 with a project called, uh, basically called Blue Roots that actually is exploring the, the influence of kind of jazz and Latin and Caribbean music just showing these deep threads that we're talking about today um, with a through original music and compositions. And that's on May 26th, 7 p.m.
at Studio 620. Hope you can be there. Another awesome session by the great J.J. Pattershaw. We thank you so much for this. I love the way that you went through the history of the blues and, you know, you not only played it for us and you showed us that form, which we see that in so much music these days in different genres, but um, the history of it is very rich and I highly recommend uh, take J.J.'s advice, go back and read and do your research and I know you'll enjoy on the journey of the blues. Um, if you enjoyed our session today, um, and maybe you have a future topic that you want to suggest, uh, we would love to hear from you. Or maybe if you just want to say, hey, I want to hear more sessions from JJ, just email us at info at clearwaterjazz.com. Uh, and we would love to hear from you. And don't forget, um, these sessions are free. So please make sure you share with other people, whether they're musicians or just people that love music. Um, you can always check out our past sessions at www.clearwaterjazz.com slash education. So thank you for joining us again. And until next time, like we always say, keep it swinging, everyone. Have an awesome day. Bye-bye. Yes, thank you.